Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sergeant Sam DeSelva from the Community Relations Section. Here with me today is also Corporal Hamblin from the Field Operations Division who will be joining us. I would like to welcome all of you to our community meeting where we will be discussing the national concerns for crimes against the Asian community. This is a very serious and troubling concern. It is absolutely horrible to be victimized and more so when it's done just because of your race. The meeting came to be because of Councilman Masuda and Field Representative Noreen Sullivan. So a special thank you goes out to them. There were many concerned residents that reached out to Councilman Masuda with que questions and concerns. We have a lineup of uh, dignitaries that would speak on the matter. Uh, we also have subject matter experts that would speak on the matter and provide valuable information and resources. Towards the end of the meeting, there will be a Q&A portion. Please know that you can type in a question at any time during the meeting. We will hold these questions till the end and answer them during the Q&A portion. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, our Lieutenant uh, from the Community Relations Section, uh, Lieutenant Aguilar. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, good evening. My name is Javier Aguilar. I'm the Lieutenant in the Community Relations Section. Uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for being here for this very important event. Uh, here at the Pasadena Police Department, we have a zero tolerance towards hate crimes and detest criminal acts or threats of violence against a person or a group because of their actual perceived race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, or disability. We have a zero tolerance approach towards hate crimes, and I think you will enjoy our presentation today. Uh, before I give it back to Sergeant De Silva, <clears throat> I would like to congratulate Karen Kaluuya Peterson as the first non-sworn executive staff member in 30 years. Karen will command a division, oversee large projects, and lead approximately 120 professional staff members. Karen? Thank you, Lieutenant, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. I am Karen Kaluuya Peterson, and I'm humbled and honored to serve as the executive administrator for the Pasadena community and for the police department. Have a safe and pleasant evening. Sergeant De Silva. Thank you, Karen, and congratulations again, Karen. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, our chief of police, uh, Chief uh, John Perez. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, and I appreciate everybody being online tonight. This is a very, very important time in our nation's history. Uh, for the past uh, year, we have been struggling with a world pandemic, a national issue of uh, epidemic of violence, and many other issues with the economy. And a lot of it is based on people being able to connect, find balance in our issues, and learning to support one another. So tonight, uh, I want to uh, really thank everybody for being online. I want to thank Chief Brian Solinsky from the South Pasadena PD for being here, Captain uh, Rick uh, Nakamura from San Gabriel PD, Sergeant Kendrick Wu of San Marino PD, Corporal Lillian Shaw of Sierra Madre PD, and Nick Rodriguez, Assistant City Manager for Pasadena. And I'm, I appreciate everybody being here. This message has got to go uh, out far and wide for people in the community of what we stand for. It's difficult at times because of policing incidents uh, for the police to make stands, for the community to really understand who we are. But we stand for uh, human rights. We stand against racism. We stand against hate crime. But many times it's difficult for us uh, for that message to be heard because of the critical incidents that we have to engage in that really brings a lot of fog and uh, confusion for people. But to know this group of people that are here, the diversity that we have, many of us, who are like myself, who are children of immigrant parents and have families who are immigrants. We understand this journey. We understand this journey of trying to connect in our communities and trying to really understand that uh, we need to stand together. So the message tonight as I pass on this mic is gonna be really to understand this is about the fear that's growing in our communities that needs to really be controlled and understood. So we're all supporting one another. And it's not that simple when we turn on the nightly news or we watch the incidents happening, or even the active shooters are beginning to increase in communities across this country. Um, we have to ensure that we create community. We are supporting one another. This is not a lone journey for an immigrant who may be Asian or any other background that feels they're on their own by themselves, feeling that they have nobody to turn to. That shouldn't be the case. We as a community have to support one another. They should have the ability to connect to organizations, to people, and have the confidence to call 911, the police department, to ensure they're going to get the help that they deserve. 
And that's one of the biggest, biggest messages we could give tonight is to have the confidence to call the police department, uh, reach out to the police department, have conversations with us and get to know us in our community. It has to happen. We have many people that want division in our community, that want to keep police separate from the community, but we have to really, really um, pursue unity and come together and not let this overtake our great country together that has been made of immigrants since day one. So from that point, um, I appreciate again, everybody being here and we'll be here to answer questions uh, and provide uh, statistical data. But again, it's about the community coming together and supporting one another. There's no larger message than that to reduce our fear. Uh, Sergeant De Silva, I'll get it back to you, sir. Thank you, Chief. At this time, it's my honor to introduce uh, our mayor, Mayor of uh, Pasadena, Victor Gordo. Thank you, Sergeant, and thank you, Chief. Uh, I, I want to uh, offer gratitude and, and welcome everyone for joining this conversation. You know, as uh, Chief Perez points out, um, you know, hate against anyone uh, has to be denounced, but also action needs to be taken. Uh, it's not just about words, it's about being present in the moment and ensuring that our individual and our collective voice is heard. As an immigrant, you know, I was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, um, spoke Spanish, uh, and I remember uh, very clearly uh, when people would call me uh, wetback or beaner or, you know, some of the terms that uh, we now find offensive, and some people didn't uh, in those times. Um, I couldn't defend myself uh, because I spoke Spanish. I couldn't defend myself because I was demeaned. Uh, and the more I spoke up, uh, the, more I, the more I found myself in a position of, uh, of being uh, bullied uh, as a kid until I found my voice, until I found my stride, uh, until people started to speak up on my behalf and it gave me the courage to then speak up on my behalf. And so I want to uh, thank all of our surrounding departments and jurisdictions for joining that voice, for being present in the moment when it counts. Uh, for standing up for what's right uh, and for standing up for individuals like uh, me and uh, now our brothers and sisters in the Asian community who are being bullied. And sometimes the bullying is, as we all know, um, is overt. And that's the, probably, you know, the, the most obvious. And we all can find a way to speak up and say that's wrong. But sometimes it's very subtle. It can be a look demeaning someone. Uh, it can be a dismissive act, simply um, a subtle, uh, but to the person that's directed to, uh, it's not subtle. It's very direct. And so I encourage all of us when we see the same, we see it, the subtle um, dismissiveness, the subtle um, bully tactics that some use against uh, people of color or Asian Americans, uh, we need to speak up. You know, I'm, I'm in this beautiful 1910 craftsman that my family uh, lives in. And let me tell you a story about this craftsman. It was owned by Dr. Edward Engel. Uh, Dr. Engel is the father of orthodontics. So if any, for all of you who paid those bills for orthodontics, you can blame uh, the person who lived in my home uh, because he invented orthodontics. Uh, and when people go to orthodontics school to study that practice, they still see Dr. Engel's picture on the cover of the book they still employ the practices that he invented. Uh, and I'm proud of Dr. Engel, not for his orthodontics work, uh, because it's cost me a lot of money over time, uh, but, <clears throat> but I'm proud of him because when he lived in this home, uh, it was a time when Japanese Americans were being interned. Uh, when, as he was starting the first college of orthodontics in the home next door to us, uh, he decided to make a statement about how Japanese Americans were being treated. And so this is what he did. He had 18 seats in the first school of orthodontics and he reserved four of them for Japanese Americans to be his students, to make a statement, to give people an opportunity to be present in the moment and make a difference. And, you know, regularly we see people from all over Japan come to our, to our home and they wanna walk through it and they have pictures of it. Uh, not because he was a great orthodontics or orthodontist because he, he stepped up in the moment and they appreciate what he did. Um, and and uh, I encourage us all to have a little bit of Dr. Engel in us um, in the moment. 
not looking back and saying that was wrong, but doing it now as it's happening in the moment. And so with that, uh, I wanna thank everyone on behalf of the city council and on behalf of all residents of Pasadena uh, for being present and for lending your voice and saying hate of all kind is not acceptable in our city or anywhere in this country or anywhere in the world. Uh, and we're going to make a difference. And again, thank you for the surrounding to the surrounding jurisdictions for, for also joining us in the moment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, at this time, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our Congresswoman, Judy Chu. Thank you. Hello. I am so glad to be taking part in this incredibly important conversation today on the rise of anti-Asian violence and how we can keep communities safe. I want to especially thank the Pasadena Police Department and our police chief, John Perez, for hosting this conversation. I want to encourage you to continue with this engagement because I know how impactful it is. Law enforcement are vital partners in keeping our communities safe. And so dialogues like this are so important for building the understanding and trust that we need. Just a few days ago, I returned from Georgia where I led a congressional delegation to visit the three Asian owned spas where a gunman killed eight people, including six Asian women. We visited the victims' families, and we drove the 27 miles from the first spa to the second two to demonstrate to ourselves that this was not about a bad day or a sex addiction. This was about targeting and killing Asian women. Even with a police escort, the trip took us about 40 minutes, which means that he had plenty of time to reconsider. But instead, he was determined to act on a prejudice specifically against Asian Americans. Now, while this was the most lethal incident that we've seen, it was not an isolated one. This plague of anti-Asian violence is being felt all across the country, including right here in the San Gabriel Valley. In Rosemead, a teacher named Matthew Leung was sitting at a bus stop when he was beaten with his own cane, causing him to lose part of his finger. Last year, the actor Tsi Ma was shopping at the Pasadena Whole Foods when someone stopped their car in front of him and shouted that he should be quarantined. A Pasadena resident, Tani Jurapersuki, was riding the gold line on the way home when she was uh, assaulted with a 15 minute verbal uh, series of insults about Asian people and how about how they carry disease. These are just a few of the over 3,800 anti-Asian hate crimes and hate incidents that we have experienced but we know that there have been more. And that is why I am so appreciative to our Pasadena police for having converse, conversations like these to take these hate crimes and incidents seriously, because we need our community members to know that they have somewhere to turn if they have encountered such a hate crime and that they will be taken seriously. In Congress, I'm leading the effort to fight anti-Asian hate crimes. I'm pushing for the No Hate Act, which will provide support and resources to local police to help them improve hate crime tracking and reporting. I'm also supporting the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, which will create a position at the Department of Justice to monitor hate crimes and help improve reporting. I'm so grateful that we have an ally in this in President Biden. In just the first week, he issued an executive memorandum to address the issue of anti-Asian hate. And just this week, he built on that with a number of historic new actions. This includes almost $50 million to help AAPI survivors of violent attacks and the establishment of a DOJ cross-agency initiative to address anti-Asian violence, including new federally funded resources. But what is most important is that we have the community support we need, and that starts with conversations like today's. So let me say this, if you know someone who has been a victim of an anti-Asian hate crime or incident, please report it to the police or at stopaapihate.org. If you want to help fight hate crimes, you might consider taking bystander intervention training, which teaches the five Ds co of combating hate crimes, direct, delegate, distract, delay, and document. These trainings are being offered free at Asian American Advancing Justice Online. Most importantly, speak out about your desire to stop Asian hate. That message is so powerful to so many. Together, I know that we can stop these hate crimes and keep 
our communities safe. Thank you, Congresswoman Chu. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Sergeant Keith Gomez. He's uh, a homicide sergeant and uh, the sergeant against crimes against uh, persons. Keith, it's all yours. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Gomez. I am a, a sergeant at Pasadena PD, and I currently supervise the robbery homicide unit. Um, so part of the responsibilities of my unit is to investigate hate-related crimes. Um, and to walk you through the process, uh, like most of our crimes, it starts at the patrol level. Uh, there will be a call for service that the officers will respond to and or they will make an observation as they're driving around and see uh, some type of criminal act occurring in their presence. Patrol is responsible for the preliminary investigation. So in a hate crime, for instance, uh, they will contact the victim, they will contact uh, forensic personnel if there's evidence uh, to be collected or a crime scene examination that needs to be conducted. Uh, in a hate crime incident, they will notify a supervisor who will then uh, notify the watch commander and it makes its way up the chain of the command uh, for obvious reasons. It's, it's a serious crime and they want no delay in the notification of a hate crime occurring, getting up to the chief. Based on the severity of the crime, specifically if there are injuries, if it involves violence uh, and the injuries are severe enough, a decision will be made uh, whether or not myself and the on-call detectives get called out from home and start investigating the crime immediately. Um, otherwise, what we'll do is once patrol uh, handles the initial preliminary investigation, uh, it will be documented as a hate crime. Proper notification is made to the watch commander, supervisors, uh, and the chief. Um, we will run with the case the next morning when the police report is written. Um, evidence is collected. Uh, we will be in the next morning and we will start conducting follow-up. Um, again, if it's a severe crime, uh, if there is some life-threatening injuries or it requires immediate follow-up investigation, then we will get called in from home. And no matter what, uh, what uh, time of night it is, we'll begin our investigation. Um, I think the important thing to understand though about hate crimes versus hate incidents, and I think that that's where there's, there's some confusion is as the law is written right now, California law, there is a difference between what people perceive as a hate crime or even a threat. However, it's not illegal per California law. Um, so in order for speech to be illegal in California, uh, even if it's derogatory against one of the protected classes, um, the speech must be threatening in nature to the degree that it, that it meets the elements of a criminal threat. And criminal threats have different categories that must be met, different elements that make it illegal. So there is a balance between someone's First Amendment right to say something that's horrific and um, should be condemned. However, if it doesn't meet the elements of a criminal threat, even if it's derogatory towards a protected class, it does not make it illegal. So what we normally see, my office, and it isn't frequent, um, is you'll see an underlining crime or an underlying crime, uh, an assault, a robbery, um, a battery. And if we can prove that either the entire motivation or the entire intent or part of the intent was based on um, that person's protected class, then you have a hate crime. And usually you'll see it in the form of an enhancement. So if somebody assaults someone with a baseball bat, it's a violation of penal code section 245A1. If we can prove that they had specific intent, not general intent, uh, specific intent that their intent or motivation behind committing that act was in part or in whole based on that person's gender, their race, uh, their religion, so on and so forth, then we can have uh, an enhancement added uh, to the underlying crime. Um, but simply someone believing that they were the target of a hate crime, they were robbed or they were assaulted, and they believe 
that they were the victim of a hate crime does not mean that we can prove the specific intent of a hate crime. So um, I, I think there is some confusion. And, and for those that don't know, I'll explain in real basic terms, the difference between uh, general intent and specific intent. If someone fires a firearm and I have a witness that says, I saw uh, John Doe fire a firearm, I can prove that, that the general intent is that you actually fired the firearm. There, there's evidence to support that you fired the firearm. Proving why you fired it is the specific intent. And that takes a lot more um, investigative follow-up to, to get to what someone's motivation is for committing an act. Just proving they committed an act is general intent. Why they committed the act or what their intentions were is specific intent. And that's what you need uh, for a hate crime violation uh, with current California law. Um, we'll talk about some of the stats that uh, the Community Relations Office has collected from some of the local agencies. Not all the local agencies in the San Gabriel Valley got back to us, uh, but just to give you an idea of some of the hate crimes that have occurred in the San Gabriel Valley to include uh, Pasadena. In 2018, uh, the city of Pasadena had zero hate crimes against Asians. 2019, one. In 2021, one person. Um, and then in, in 2021, so far, it's been zero. In the city of San Gabriel, the stats that they provided weren't specific to Asians. So the stats I'm about to provide could include any, uh, any persons protected in that uh, protected class. In 2018, there was one reported hate crime. 2019, two. In 2021, and so far this year, so far this year, zero in the city of San Gabriel. South Pasadena, like San Gabriel, uh, the stats they provided is for all hate crimes, not just specific to, to Asians. They've had two in the last five years. Um, again, that's not to say that there hasn't been hate incidents. Um, for instance, someone yelling out that, uh, you know, you need to be quarantined would be considered a hate incident and it should be documented. However, per California law, the district attorney's office would not file any charges because uh, the, the speech was not uh, threatening for one. And B, when you make a threat, you have the person making the threat has to have the present ability to carry out that threat of violence. And so again, there's, there's elements that must be followed. So I'm sure there's a lot more hate incidents that have occurred, but as far as, as, far as hate crimes, uh, those are the statistics. Um, and, and keep in mind too, with the, with, with the many changes occurring at the DA's office, we're finding it harder and harder to get um, charges filed against violent offenders. And these are laws that are already on the books. So simply because there is a violation of law doesn't necessarily mean that the district attorney's office is going to file uh, charges against that suspect. There have been many things that have occurred that are not being filed per the California Penal Code. And so that can be frustrating for law enforcement. That could be frustrating for the community when someone should be locked up for acts of violence uh, and they're not. So that's another obstacle that we are now dealing with uh, locally. So. Sam, that's, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Keith. And uh, one other thing uh, I would like to touch on uh, before I uh, pass it on to our CSO, Sarah Presley, uh, is uh, whenever there is an incident of a hate crime, uh, there is also a file that's generated and it actually comes to the community relations section as well. So once it comes to our section, uh, we have one of our outreach officers that's assigned to that case. And this outreach officer is responsible for staying in contact with, with the victim and making sure the victim gets the adequate resources and assistance. So the detectives do the criminal investigation portion. The community relations officer stays in contact with the victim uh, and basically uh, uh, becomes a liaison that works with the Human Relations Commission and also with the Victim Assistance Program. So if there is, 
you know, uh, uh, if the victim is in need of uh, compensation for maybe injuries or maybe other loss that the victim has incurred, uh, the community relations officer would, would work with the victim and make sure that they get these resources. Another thing that we do from the community relations section is, is that we stay in contact with the victim and keep them updated on how their case is progressing through the district attorney's office or the city prosecutor's office. So this is one extra step here that we take in Pasadena uh, when somebody is a victim of a hate crime uh, because detectives get busy and their main focus and no fault of their own, their main focus is to you know, investigate the crime, you know, making sure that they apprehend the suspects and to making sure that they get the adequate file ready for the district attorney's office for filing. But we more concentrate from our office on the victim and the victim's need. Uh, so that's one, uh, one, uh, one part I wanted to touch on. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Sarah Presley. Uh, she's a community service officer. Uh, she's, uh, she's a great uh, resource for us. And she, she has a lot of good information that she's gonna pass on to all of you. Uh, Sarah, please. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Just give me one second to get my slide up. Okay, hopefully you all can see um, see my slide. Um, first, uh, I'm gonna talk about the website crimemapping.com. Um, not every agency uploads to crimemapping.com, but the Pasadena PD does. It is a very useful tool to keep an eye on what is going on in your neighborhood. Uh, the main screen of crimemapping.com looks like this. On the left side, you can type in an address, landmark, or zip code, and then it will take you to a screen very similar to to this. So it's going to give you a map and there are icons that you can click on. And then on the right side, it will give you the incident number, the type of crime, the hundred block uh, where it occurred, uh, the date and, uh, date and time. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you if something is a uh, hate crime. It just gives you the um, general type of incident, but it is a good way to keep an eye on what is going on in your, uh, in your area. Um, a few years ago, when my husband and I were looking to purchase our first home, every single website the realtor gave us, I was immediately going on to crimemapping.com to see what types of crimes were being reported in that area. So 911 is the best number to call for police, fire, or medical emergencies when immediate action is required, such as someone's health or safety or property is in jeopardy or a crime is in progress. If you need Pasadena police assistance that is not an emergency nature, the non-emergency number is the best number to call. The number is 626-744-4241. I highly recommend putting that number into your cell phone. The exact same dispatchers who answer the 911 line answer the non-emergency number. We have the non-emergency line to keep the 911 line clear for those emergencies that need immediate action. Examples of non-emergencies are a stolen bicycle, a vehicle burglary, or a noise complaint. And if you ever are in doubt as to which number to call, call 911. If you are calling 911 or the non-emergency number from your cell phone, be aware that the dispatcher cannot see where you are. They can see where the closest cell tower is, but that can be a considerable distance from where you actually are. With current technology, the only time a dispatcher can see the address that you are calling from is when you are calling from a landline. When calling from your cell phone, be prepared for the dispatcher to ask where you are calling, uh, calling from. If you cannot provide the dispatcher with the address or intersection, you can describe what you see around you. Our dispatchers are very resourceful and they know the city pretty darn well. Yes, in emergencies, our dispatchers are able to ping a cell phone, but it is a process. Cell phone companies are very particular about when we are allowed to do that and it can only be done in extreme emergencies. A modern convenience is that some reports can now be filed online. On the Pasadena Police Department website, you can click on report a crime. Online reporting can also be found under the crime tab at the top of the screen. It will take you to a screen that looks like this. 
You should not use the online reporting system for emergencies or, or for crimes that are in progress or when there's a known suspect. You can use the system to report crimes that occurred in Pasadena city limits, but not on the freeway. On this screen, you will click start report. So here's a list of crimes that can be reported online. You can report burglary, burglary of a locked vehicle, harassing phone calls, hit and run collisions, lost property, price gouging, theft, theft from an unlocked vehicle, vandalism, and vandalism of a vehicle. Once you finish filling out the online form, you will be provided with a temporary case number. A member of the Pasadena Police Department will review your report and may contact you for additional information. Once your report has been approved, you will receive an email with your permanent case number as well as a PDF file of your report. It is so convenient. I would like to take a moment to tell you about LA Crime Stoppers. The Los Angeles Regional Crime Stoppers Program is a community-based nonprofit organization that offers an anonymous way to report crimes. You'll be assigned a code. If your information leads to an arrest, you may be eligible for a cash reward up to $1,000. Your phone number and computer IP address will not be traced. You can contact LA Crime Stoppers by calling the number that is on your screen. You can also visit their website, lacrimestoppers.org, or you can download their mobile app. The um, LA Crime Stoppers flyer is available in 21 languages. On the LA Crime Stoppers website, along the top, select more, and then you can find them under foreign language flyers. So if you're not already using it, please consider using the Pasadena Citizen Service Center. You guys are our eyes and ears out in Pasadena. If you see something that needs attention like an abandoned mattress, graffiti, a street light is out, or a transient encampment, you can report it through the Citizen Service Center. You can call the number that is on your screen, visit the Citizen Service Center website, or download the mobile app. When you report an issue, a work order is generated. You will receive an email once the issue has been resolved. I have been using the Citizen Service Center for years and I'm still constantly impressed by how quickly they take care of the issues that I re report. I would also like to mention Nixle. If you would like to receive alerts from your local agencies, text your zip code to 888 777 to opt in. So let's say there's a major traffic collision on California Boulevard and Lake Avenue, and our officers are going to be closing down the area for an extended period of time. We can send out a Nixel alert of advising you to avoid the area. If there is a critically missing person, and uh, we also have the ability to send out a Nixel alert with a description of the missing. The biggest reason I recommend subscribing to Nixel alerts though, well, during non-COVID times, we have a lot of major events in Pasadena. To name a few, the Rose Parade, the Rose Bowl, the Half Marathon, concerts, football games, soccer games. We have a lot going on in Pasadena. If something major were to happen during one of our events, Nixel would be our first line of communication with the public. And that does bring me to our social media accounts. I invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our social media coordinator, Corporal Christian Allen, does a wonderful job of posting content. If you guys are on Nextdoor, you probably see me posting from time to time. But one thing to know about Nextdoor, it is a wonderful way to communicate with people in your neighborhood. However, posting to next door um, to advise your neighbors of a crime does not take the place of filing a police report. We cannot see posts that residents make. We can only see our own posts. So if you are the victim of a crime, please notify us by filing a police report, not just posting on next door. Okay. Um, I, I sincerely hope that none of you are ever the victim of a hate crime. In the event that you are a victim, on your screen is a list of resources in addition to your local police department. There's the number for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Bureau of Victim Services, the number for the Los, uh, Los Angeles County um, Commissions on Human Relations, the number for the Los Angeles City Human Relations Commission, the number for the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and the number for the South Asian Network. I will leave the screen up for a minute or two as we transition into the question and answer portion of tonight's uh, program. Down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A icon. This is where you can submit questions that you would like to have us answer. 
So from here, I would like to turn you back to Sergeant Sam De Silva. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, I'll start getting into the questions right now. One of the first questions and one of the most commonly asked questions is, how do we handle uh, translation? Or if somebody calls 911 or calls uh, the non-emergent line, and if they speak any other language other than English, uh, how do we handle it from the police department? The police department actually subscribes to a state translation service. And so on the 911 line, if somebody calls uh, that where we, don't, we do not have a dispatcher that speaks that language, what they would do is it's almost like a three-way call. We connect to the state translation service uh, and we uh, let the translation service know what language the victim speaks and the connection to somebody who will be able to translate to us is almost immediate. Uh, if you call the non-emergent line, uh, there is uh, also a similar service that we subscribe, but there is usually about a two to three minute delay on finding a translation for the non-emergent line. Uh, but that's how uh, we do communicate uh, with individuals that we do not have officers who speak that language or dispatcher available who speaks that language. This uh, same service is available to our field uh, operation division as well for patrol officers working out in the street. If they run into a victim who speaks a different language and they need to speak to that victim, they're able to call dispatch, do a three-way call and the translator would translate for us. Um, at this time, I'll start tra uh, transitioning into the questions that have been typed to us. Um, I have Lieutenant Aguilar in the office as well, and we will go one question at a time and start answering those questions. The first question, I'm going to uh, forward it to uh, uh, Sergeant uh, Keith Gomez. Uh, there was a question, Keith, that came in uh, as you were uh, explaining the different intents. And this uh, individual typed uh, the question and asked, what counts as evidence of intent? If you will be able to answer that. Sure. Am I unmuted? Yes, you okay. are, I can hear you. So um, there are three types of intent. There is general intent, which most crimes um, in California fall under general intent. There is specific intent uh, which is a bit harder to prove, and there's transferred intent. So for a hate crime, the way the penal code is authored um, and based on current legislation, we must prove as law enforcement detectives and the DA must be able to prove if they uh, end up filing charges that there is specific intent. Um, and specific, specific intent gets into someone's designated state of mind. We must be able to prove that the actor committing, for instance, we'll use hate crime as, as the example, because that's the discussion, that the act that they committed was, was based on whole or in part based on that person's protected class. Um, so for instance, if we use uh, a shooting, for example, if someone were to yell racial slurs just prior to discharging a firearm or during the course of a shooting, then that would be evidence that we could use against them that they had the specific intent of either attempting to murder that person or shoot at that person, and in part was based on their race, based on the racial slurs. Other ways we can figure out uh, someone's mindset is um, you know, legally through a search warrant, but going through their cell phone and seeing if there's literature or um, or internet history that shows some type of premeditation that their intention, their specific intent was to harm uh, someone of a protected class. Uh, interviewing people, uh, friends and family of, of a suspect and, and getting um, into their history of, of things they've said, things they've done, looking at their criminal rap sheet to see if there's a pattern where they are targeting a certain group that's protected. So there's a lot of ways that we um, search for someone's specific intent. Uh, in most cases, it's circumstantial evidence, but that must be present for a hate crime enhancement to be filed. Thank you, Keith. 
Uh, Keith, you answered like about two or three uh, different variations of questions that were up, uh, but there was uh, one or two others uh, where a certain portion wasn't answered. So I'm just going to put those together and ask a question and you'd probably be able to answer all of them at the same time. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, a person asked, you know, let's say there is a habitual offender who uh, has documented incidents of using slurs that probably necessarily wasn't, didn't meet the extent of a crime. But if there's a habitual offender that has many documented incidents, is there anything that could be done? Um, well, in addition to the documentation, if for some reason this suspect or this person who continually uses racial slurs, and even though they may not rise independently um, to a hate crime per the penal code, at some point, if this person decides to take it to the next step, God forbid, we, we, we would then have the pattern of circumstantial evidence to show specific intent if, in fact, he... Um, commits an act of violence, uh, makes a threat uh, that's, that's criminal in nature, um, vandalizes property. Those things would be important documentation to help us prove the specific intent. Um, another thing is that uh, you can get uh, a civil restraining order that uh, the, uh, the threshold for getting a restraining order is much less than us getting charges filed criminally. So if someone is repeatedly harassing you with racial slurs, um, there are methods uh, that you can use to get a restraining order, preventing them from, um, from approaching your place of business, from approaching your home, from approaching a school, wh whatever you uh, decide that you need protected, then if they violate a restraining order, um, then the police can take action uh, for the violation of the restraining order. So it still helps to have these things documented. And again, uh, if it doesn't rise to a hate crime, you can get a, a civil restraining order that we can then make an arrest if there is uh, a violation. Thank you, Keith. Uh, this next question, I'm gonna answer it. Uh, let me read it. It says, good evening to all. How do we protect ourselves while we are walking out on the streets and suddenly we get physically or verbally attacked? How do we respond right at that second? As a Filipino American, to me being an Asian descent, uh, we usually avoid confrontation. How much more to fight back physically? So uh, the, the way I, I would let you know that is, is if you are feeling threatened and if somebody is intimidating you and you're in a situation that you're uncomfortable, you do not have to decide at that time, oh, am I being victimized to the point where I should call the police or not? Call the police. If you are threatened by anyone or you're in a situation that you're feeling uncomfortable, call the police. That's what we're here for. And we will respond there. And, you know, we can de-escalate the situation uh, just by our mere presence. You know, you're going to be safe and hopefully that individual will be there on, on their way. So that will be my first piece of advice. Now, another thing that I would like to touch on, and this I have heard from many uh, 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 from the Asian community is that, you know, uh, people of Asian descent sometimes are victimized, but they do not report. And that was actually one of the questions. How do we plan to try and encourage the Asian community to actually report when they are victimized or when they believe they have been victimized uh, in a racially motivated incident? So how, what we plan to do from the Pasadena Police Department is and where we need help from all of you is uh, we're gonna do a big social media push and education is key. You know, it's really important that we reach out to our Asian community and basically educate them on uh, what type of crimes are occurring, what their rights are and what resources there are out there and basically encourage them and being very proactive with community engagement events, we're able to interact, they get to know us and they get to be more comfortable. So that's what we plan to do from our end. And what you can do from your end is talk to your friends and family, encourage them, you know, let them know that they do not have to be victimized. Let them know that if they're in an uncomfortable situation, don't hesitate. If you're even thinking about it, you know, then you should be dialing 911 if you're in a situation where you think you want an emergency response. Now, again, I'm going to ask you to know the difference 
between 911 and a non-emergent call. Uh, if you're in a minor fender bender and you could pull to the side and exchange information. Uh, and, you know, I would encourage call the non-emergent line, but you're in a situation where you're walking down the street and somebody's in your face and you're feeling threatened, call 911. That's what we're here for. So the next question I have, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Sergeant Keith Gomez if he will be able to answer it. Uh, the question reads, uh, DA Gascon has stopped filing enhancements. So is the DA even filing hate crime enhancements? Question mark. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, Gascon has stopped filing a number of enhancements, uh, many of which uh, I believe put the community at risk. And uh, although I don't have any specific examples yet, because we haven't had to file a hate crime uh, under under Gascon yet, uh, I, I would not be surprised if uh, those enhancements uh, are included in this chopping block. Clearly the decision not to file many of these enhancements make our community unsafe. Uh, many violent criminals are, uh, are in a revolving door right now, going in and coming right out based on his directives that have um, essentially um, e eliminated lawful uh, enhancements. So I don't know if uh, the hate crime enhancements would be any different under his, uh, under his regime. Thank you, uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, there's another question that basically came on here uh, where an individual asked if they will be able to report a hate crime online. Uh, if it's a hate crime, uh, it, it won't be handled online. I'm sure you can report it online, but what happens is anytime you report any type of crime online, uh, there is a records technician that monitors all the record, uh, reports coming in. And if they see the nature and the serious serious nature of this crime, it's immediately assigned to a detective uh, and uh, taken up to a detective division. So you can, but we, we don't encourage you trying to report such crimes online. That's a crime that you need to call the police department and ask for a police officer's response. Yeah, detectives um, are not the ones who write the reports. Our patrol officers are the ones who write the reports. And that's very much a report that a patrol officer needs to write, and then it will get assigned to a detective. Uh, Keith, I was wondering if you would be able to take this question as well. Uh, an individual asked, what are examples of criminal threats? Uh, Keith, your mic is mu muted. So a criminal threat is, is, uh, occurs when someone makes a threat of causing great bodily harm and or death. Uh, and the threat must be very, uh, it must be unconditional, uh, unequivocal. There must be no doubt that the language used by the suspect making the threat uh, conveys to the person receiving the threat that um, it's a threat against their life and or the threat of violence will cause um, serious bodily injury. Uh, in addition for that crime to be completed, the person receiving the threats uh, must take the threat seriously, be in fear uh, for their life, um, and the suspect must have the present ability to carry out the threat. So all those elements must be present in order for there to be a violation of the uh, criminal threats statute. Thank you, Keith. Um, there was a comment that came in uh, from uh, Beverly Morgan. Uh, I want to thank the Pasadena Police Department for responding when I felt threatened while walking down Orange Grove Boulevard. Thank you for that comment. And uh, uh, again, uh, if, if you need the Police Department for any incident, please don't hesitate to call us. Uh, there was another uh, question that I'll read right now. So uh, not many Pasadena residents follow the official social media channel. What are plans to engage local community centers, community orgs, churches, Buddhist temples, Asian supermarkets, et cetera? Uh, 
like I mentioned before, we, we uh, this is this is the first step towards this. We have a big uh, social media campaign that we're putting into place. Uh, there is a, a, a plan that we have to move forward in trying to address this very serious concern. Uh, we are going to reach out to the community, and one of the things that we do uh, that we, where we can reach large groups of people is through our social media. Now, we also have several officers uh, that are assigned to the Business Watch Group. Not only they interact with businesses, but they do also interact with churches, uh, large businesses which fall into the Asian supermarkets, uh, Buddhist temples, and other different organizations. So these officers already have that network built and that's how we'll share this information and uh, start this big education campaign. If you just give me a second, let me try and find a few other questions. And Keith, if you might be able to answer this for me, uh, an uh, individual typed in and asked, what is an enhancement? Sure, Sammy. Uh, an enhancement is, um, and it's, it's governed by the penal code, but an enhancement is if during the course of an underlying crime, other factors exist, like for instance, um, if you commit uh, a robbery and you use a firearm, there's an enhancement for the underlying crime is the robbery, but if you use a firearm, there's an additional enhancement or there's an enhancement added to the underlying crime, which uh, when filed would give the defender or give that suspect additional time in prison. Uh, if you commit a robbery and you're a convicted felon, um, you've been to prison before and you're back out or you already have a, a strike and you commit the robbery, that would be another enhancement added to your charges that would add uh, time to your prison, uh, to, your new, to your new case, new prison time. So it enhances an underlying crime based on um, either specific circumstances of that crime, what weapon you use, how you use it. Uh, again, if we're talking about a hate crime, the things you, you say could be considered an enhancement and it's also based on your past criminal conduct. If you're a repeat offender, then there are methods um, established in the penal code that punish repeat offenders much stronger than they would public or punish a, a first time offender. Um, because clearly if someone's a repeat offender, they're not, they're not learning how to behave in society. And so the law is set up to punish those that are repeat offenders uh, more heavily. So, they enhance an underlying crime and, and people ultimately get uh, more time in jail. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Karen, I'm not sure if your mic is activated, if you might be able to answer a question for us that came in. Sure, what do you need? Okay, so one individual asks, what's the average response time for a call made to request police support in Pasadena? So our average response time for priority one calls, which are classified as calls that are occurring right now um, in progress, is three about three minutes and 20 seconds, and those were priority one. Uh, priority two response time is a call that it's um, a property crime that's occurring now, and our response time for that is six minutes and 29, six minutes and 29 seconds. Thank you, Karen. Uh, uh -huh. We have pretty much, I've gone down the list. We pretty much answered all of the questions. Uh, I'm gonna give it a few more minutes uh, for residents if they have any other questions that they can think of uh, and uh, we'll remain here. And if any other questions come up, I'll let the group know. So, Sergeant De Silva, this is uh, Victor Gordo. I, I, I have to excuse myself, as you know, I, uh, I have another call at 7.30. Uh, but I, I want to thank everyone for participating and for allowing me to be a part of it. Um, and uh, let's keep working together. Um, as Chief uh, Perez said, you know, it, we need to build community uh, and stand up again when, when we see something, when we say something, if we know it's making us, uh, us uncomfortable or the person next to us uncomfortable, 
um, we need to say something about it. So I wanna encourage everyone to continue the dialogue. Uh, and again, thank you all for, for allowing me to be a part of it. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for joining us and giving us this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. It was a pleasure hearing from you tonight. Thank you. Sarah, you might be able to answer this question. One of the questions came up that if we would be able to share the recording of this meeting somewhere, uh, we did record the meeting, as everyone know, uh, and we have uh, different methods where we can uh, share these videos. Sarah, I don't know if you have any ideas. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am, yes, it is rec uh, recording. Um, I'm going to be uploading it um, to Dropbox tomorrow morning, and I'm going to be sharing it with Pasadena Media. Um, Pasadena Media is going to be um, uploading it, and we can share that link. Um, we can share it to uh, next uh, next door or Unfortunately, I don't have my contact info on uh, on any of the slides, but um, if anyone would like me to send it directly to, the, uh, to them, my email address is spresley, so that's S-P-R-E-S-L-E-Y at cityofpasadena.net. Um, I'll ha be happy to send the, um, the file to you as well, but um, I will be providing it to Pasadena Media tomorrow morning and they will be posting it. So this will uh, this will be the last question, and after that we'll start wrapping it up. Uh, the last question is basically a resident asked, uh, where would be the best place for uh, individuals to go so that they could get updated information on crimes against Asians? Uh, what I would recommend is that you keep our contact information. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you have your slide with your contact information and my contact information. If you do have it, we'll put it up. Otherwise, we can give it uh, verbally. <laughs> I don't, but I'm pretty fast at typing. So if you give me one second, I'll type right. that up. Awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and another method is, you know, again, I'm going, I'm going to encourage everyone to subscribe to our social media because this is how we are able to reach large groups of people uh, uh, in a very convenient manner. Yeah, uh, nice. No. Uh, so I would uh, I would uh, strongly recommend uh, all of you to uh, subscribe to our social media. Uh, I'm not sure if Sarah has the slide ready with our contact information. I don't type uh, quite that fast. Okay, it's okay. Uh, I can give uh, anyone who has a piece of paper and a pen uh, uh, uh -huh. direct phone number. Uh, it's uh, 626-744-7694. And you can always reach out to me with uh, questions uh, that you may have uh, regarding these crimes. And I'll try and if it's not going, going to impede any investigation, I can uh, always try and get that information for you. Okay, so uh, hopefully I didn't make any typos. Um, Sergeant Sam De Silva's con uh, contact information is up at the top. Um, his email address, as well as his direct line. And then um, I am underneath my email address as well as direct line. All right, well, uh, there's uh, one last question that popped up. I'll answer it. And uh, at that time, uh, we'll conclude our uh, meeting. And again, I'd like to thank everyone uh, uh, Sergeant Keith Gomez, thank you very much, sir, for stepping in and helping out with this information. And CSO Sarah Presley, thank you very much. You did an amazing job, as always. Um, the last question that came in is, is uh, do you always record if an individual reports a racially motivated hate incident, or is that detail omitted? Well, anytime any person calls the police department uh, and there's a police report written, uh, details are not omitted. Uh, that basically the victim statement would be in the police report. Uh, and uh, thereafter, it will be reviewed by a sergeant and it would it, the, this report then ends up going to uh, the detective bureau. So uh, and there is multiple different phases. If uh, they feel as though that it is a racial crime, a uh, crime that was motivated by race, uh, it will be investigated in that fashion. But where I'm trying to get with this is anything that a victim reports to us, yes, it is documented and no details are omitted. 
So that would conclude our meeting and uh, I would, uh, I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us today. Thank you everyone.